Thanks very much, Manda. Um, yeah, you'll see from the billing that I'm here in two guises, both as um, the co-founder of Dig Ventures, but also a PhD candidate researching new tech-enabled modes of participation in what might be called the digital and collaborative economy. Um, now, a busy couple of jobs, you might think, and you'd be absolutely right. Um, the founder of LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman, says that founding a startup is like throwing yourself off a cliff and building the plane on the way down. I think if you add into that an 80,000 word thesis, welcome to my pain. But what on earth could have possessed me to want to both found a startup while simultaneously researching this emerging field? In a word, exasperation. Now I'll come on to the startup side of that exasperation equation in a second. But in terms of the research side, it was a concern with what was being written about and published about innovation and particularly crowd-based modes of working in archaeology, much of it um, a commentary on our own work. I'm talking, of course, about the, both the positive, smiley face evaluations that see um, tech as our salvation on the one hand, but also the more negative, cynical takes that see uh, crowd-based approaches, particularly crowdfunding, as a neoliberal sleight of hand, the final extension of the market into what is, would otherwise be a pure and unsullied arena. Now these are testing times, and I think in a rush to either um, uh, condemn or champion the new, new thing, we may be losing sight of the vast magnitude of the social and economic changes that are taking place. It's a frame of reference that sociologist Michael Mann calls the sociology of the last five minutes. I've always found that quite ironic when applied to archaeology, given that our normal temporal ways of counting are in 50-year blocks. Now, in this very short contribution, I'll be taking a wider view of innovation um, in archaeology, looking at the emergence of new business and operational models within the context of changing social, technological, and funding landscapes. But first things first, who is Dig Ventures? Well, Dig Ventures is a social business that we launched in 2012 um, that designs and delivers collaborative archaeological projects and experiences. We use crowdfunding and crowdsourcing and digital technology to create new opportunities for the public to participate in archaeological research. Though we were forged in some of the tough economic conditions described by Doug and Gavin, that wasn't our primary motivator. Our mission was to find an alternative business model that could provide better, um, more impactful, more collaborative archaeological research. That opportunity came along for us in the summer of 2012. A friend had taken over the management of a site called Flag Fern. As many of you will know, one of the UK's most important uh, Bronze Age wetland site also one of the most significant visitor attractions. Now since the original excavations had finished in the early 2000s, visitors had stopped coming and that left very little money with which to deal with the archaeology. Now Kickstarter had launched a couple of years earlier um, in the US and was having great success crowdfunding arts and uh, culture projects. So um, we decided to build a project at Flag Fen, and within three months we'd raised £32,000 from a network of 250 people, bringing 120 of those um, with us to dig at the site. Now in financial terms, this was a great success, uh, but this was eclipsed by the non-financial benefits of people rolling their sleeves up and actively participating in our research. And this new way of working created a ripple effect for the visitor attraction itself, building audience and income for the site. Nearly 2,000 people visited over the course of the three weeks that were in the field, representing a 30% year-on-year increase in visitorship, or a third of their annual gate fees. And of those visitors, 60% had never come to the site before, and about half of those were local. So alongside dealing with the archaeology, we managed to build new income for the site, build new audience for the site, both digitally and physically. We thought to ourselves, well, you know what? Maybe this could work elsewhere. So we decided to give up our day jobs and found Dig Ventures full time. Or throw ourselves off a cliff, depending, it certainly felt like it. 
So since then, we've done this a further 12, 12 times in the UK, a couple of times in Europe, twice in the US, raising up about £1 million pounds and for archaeology, bringing several thousand people to site. Now, these are good round numbers. And within the wider economic context, you can see that the alternative finance market in the UK rose to 3.2 billion in 20, 2015. That's up 82% from 1.7 billion in 2014. So this new approach clearly offers promise. But it can also be seen as part of a new way of working, part of a wider suite of social, digital, and economic changes where digitally collaborating in peer-to-peer -peer networks is disrupting traditional ways of doing business and organizing activities. Now, our good friends at Nesta have developed a typology to understand how this all works in what they describe as the collaborative economy. You can see these four pillars or groups, some of the uh, businesses and organizations that work in this field. And what links them all together is that box at the top. They enable access instead of ownership. They encourage decentralized networks over centralized institutions, and they unlock wealth either with or without money. So from collaborative consumption models like Airbnb, where many of us will be staying uh, this week, to collaborative production models like Quirky, to collaborative learning models, MOOCs, such as FutureLearn, to collaborative finance models, such as Kickstarter. These organizations draw on platform economics, making use of idle assets to create new marketplaces. In so doing, they challenge existing businesses and ways of organizing. So positioning the Dig Ventures experiment uh, within the digital and collaborative economy certainly fits with our experience of this hybrid model. But rather than focus on just one of those pillars, uh, trying to undertake several different generalized projects within one of those pillars, we focused on a single vertical, archaeology, um, to service and build a community around a common interest. So beginning with collaborative finance, we've been able to generate an income um, from a network of community, uh, but also non-financial contributions. But it became very clear to us early on that crowdfunding is about much more than the money. It's about building an engaged community of uh, advocates who want to behave not as passive consumers of what you do, but active participants. So from that point onwards, we developed a collaborative production platform, Digital Dicti, so that participants can publish um, data, text, photos, videos, 3D models directly from the trend side using a smartphone or tablet, and then harness uh, comments and contributions in the crowd. But being radically open like this doesn't remove all the barriers to entry. By publishing all our data in real time, that doesn't really matter much if only a very small minority of people actually understand what it is or how to use it. So this has led to us experimenting with a collaborative learning platform and we, we've just developed a MOOC or learning management system to deepen our community's engagement with our practice. So it's at this point, I think, that half the room are probably thinking, fantastic. How can we do this? How can we take that forward? Whilst the other half are thinking, well, what about the ethics? Um, what about the issues um, with publication? How do you manage voluntary participation at scale? What about traditional funders? And what about traditional research? I think you're all right to be concerned. Clearly from the survey, it seems that many of us are great supporters of innovation, but we all perceive that there are some real barriers to moving forward with it, either culturally or institutionally. If I was to sum this up into a tweetable sentence, I'd say it's because the evolution of technology is far outpacing the development of an ethical practice that underlies it. Now, outside the discipline, you'll see this with a recent Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Analytica um, scandal and the issues that Facebook are going through 
much more prosaically at home, you might think of this as there are issues around how to archive digital photography. A problem that the profession hasn't quite got its head around, but we're already onto a new improved technology, photogrammetry 3D modelling. A new set of challenges without sorting out the last set. So as innovators and early adopters, it was clear to us that the only way to lead would be to have a clear sense of ethics and a robust evaluative framework. Our goal in this is to ensure that any claims around new ways of working are as, as clearly evidenced, um, any ways about new ways of working in the present are as clearly evidenced as any conclusions we may draw out the past from the excavation itself. This has meant devising a very clear theory of change, benchmarked against standards of evidence that allow us to measure what we do from one side of the spectrum, our pure research or intrinsic values, right out to our social and community outcomes, our instrumental outcomes. So by defining explicitly our ethical framework and our success measures, we can confidently evolve our practice in entirely new and unexpected ways. It's a commitment that's been vital um, in giving uh, more traditional grant funders or research bodies the confidence with which to partner with us, either through match funding or by becoming partners on our research team. So to sum up our contribution to today's session, I hope to have outlined how uh, engaging with innovation, either by taking it forward yourself or by enabling it and supporting it within your organisations, has massive benefits. I believe that thinking about archaeologists' contemporary challenges with a long-term view of an archaeologist will enable strategies not just to keep the roof on, but to creatively reimagine our purpose for the long term. So be bold. Try something different. Jump off a cliff. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. This isn't actually my title. It's just a reminder that we study change, and therefore we should, in theory, be well-placed to deal with it. I work for Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service, and this is a local government organisation. So what I'm going to say about change and innovation is from this particular perspective. There are many ways, of course, to change and innovate at every different level within the profession, from the bottom to the top, um, but you need to find the right one for your organisation. We were created in 2012 and include archive collection services, including conservation, digitization, user services, um, the HER and advisory teams, and a learning and outreach team which spans the genres. Um, any of you heard of the mighty bush? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, so that works across, across all the areas, and I mean all the areas. As I've only got 10 minutes, I'm just going to outline what we have achieved so far and some lessons we've learned about making it and managing change. I have loads of documents, should anybody be interested. Right, you don't need to read all of this. Um, basically, it's the money. It's always the money. So if you look at the left-hand column and the right-hand column, you will see that our turnover has gone down a couple of hundred thousand pounds. We have lost some jobs. And obviously that's a little bit more with inflation. Our funding, oh, I must say this does not include our commercial archaeological unit. This is our statutory, quasi-statutory and non-statutory services. So our county council funding was 1.5 million. Um, last year it was just over, well, 550,000. But of that, 200,000 went straight back to the county council to pay for HR, IT, etc., etc. Our external funding in 2011 was 117,000, and that's gone up to about 506. So, in other words, from being in almost entirely county council funded, we're now half and half. And that reflects in, uh, in the, how our staff are paid. So, in 11 12, we had 31 funded and from the county council and six, and now it's half and half. 
And again, those figures don't include our commercial field archaeology. Right, so what is it we've got? What have we got over this time? It's what I like to call local government with privileges. Um, we have, and I am amazed at this, we have kept all our services together. Uh, we, uh, Worcestershire County Council is a commissioning body and I thought we would learn, we would lose our field section and we would, our Worcestershire archaeology and we would lose the learning and outreach at the very least. In actual fact, we managed to keep it all together. Um, and as, as uh, the great Billy Bragg says, there is, there is power in our union. <laughs> and more tritely, we are greater than the sum of our parts. I think this is incredibly important. We fought really hard to keep our services together because they support each other and enhance each other. And for us, that's a fundamental win. We keep the Bank of Worcestershire. Our grants come in in little dribs and drabs. Um, it's absolutely fantastic to just know that you have to make the money by the end of the year. We are not in a position yet to go out of that. It's really important to us. But we've got a surplus sharing agreement, no more budget cuts. We've got an investment in product development and marketing and the ability to carry over surplus. So I think that that is local government with privileges. Any of you that work in local government will realise quite how many privileges that is. So that's where we are. So this is just, this is some, some little boys at one of our public events. So there's no more figures now. <laughs> so I'd like to very briefly outline how I think you can achieve the right outcomes, whatever they are, for your service. Um, now, I think the most important thing is your vision, is what you want as a professional in your service. So what we wanted, what our goal was, our, our I suppose, five-year goal, was we wanted to keep all the elements of our service together and maintain enough st staff capacity to grow. If you lose too many staff, you fall over. So that was all we were asking. And our strategy, excluding our, non -com our, our commercial archaeology service, was to increase external income. Well, we did want to do that first, <laughs> obviously. But to increase external income, love, and largely in the first few years, that's come from grant income. The problem with that, it's too many eggs in one basket, especially as the grants are all reducing. So over the last three years, we've been trying to develop commercial income. This is, for any of you that work in this sector, very difficult to do in statutory and quasi-statutory services, and we've got a long way to go. But we have, we have started that. So how did, we, how did we achieve this? So that was our goal. That's what, this is our strategy. How did we achieve it? Um, in my mind, it's really important, you have to hold two things in your head at the same time. So the first is, as an archaeologist or an archivist, is to stay focused on your principles, to remember the value for society now and in the future of the history and the remains of the human past, not least the excitement of new discoveries that new discoveries generate. After all, we're in a democracy, so if, if people don't think we're of any value, they're going to get rid of us. Right. But at the same time, we need to use the language of the people who are in charge of us. In the case of the county council, that's money, right? It is no good saying we are really important. Because quite understandably, the councillors and our directors are going to go, oh, and children's services aren't, you know? And we still need to pay for roads. And by the way, we've got to get rid of the rubbish. Just don't even go there. You just keep that in your head. So in our case, what we needed to show was good value or best value. We needed to demonstrate that we were cheaper than other similar organisations but did more. We need to recognise and deliver the county council objectives and, if possible, demonstrate that um, you enhance the regional and national reputation of your organisation. Councillors love that. Um, and, <laughs> and also, using every method you possibly can, you must engage your community. So, that's, that's, 
that's how that's how we try to uh, have tried to put forward our arguments using those techniques. So, but I've got some top tips as well. Um, it's about leadership, not management. And by that, I don't mean just leadership at the top of an organisation. I mean leadership all the way through. All your team must be clear on your goals and your strategy for advancing them. And this can take some time. People are not necessarily used to working in this more commercial way, particularly we found in the archive sector that our builders were a bit more used to it. And convincing them is the key to success, but that's what you've got to do. Second top tip, always do it to yourself before someone else does it to you. That enables you to retain control as much as possible. Never pretend it's just going to go away, because it won't. Um, um, the third one is um, create great advocates, and that's lots of different advocates. So obviously you need to create advocates in the community, as I said, it's a democracy. Um, but you also need to focus on the business community because they provide advice, but also a different kind of more powerful advocacy. For instance, we worked with the Chief Executive of the Chamber of Commerce on our first iterations of our business um, plan, and he went with me to see the director, and he said, John, it's a no-brainer. Now, that's quite useful <laughs> in the county council setting. It did take three years to get it, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. Um, also, use your friends' associations or interested local people with influence. But there again, you have to be careful. What we did was we dissuaded our friends from writing angry letters to the county council. And we asked people to write to the county council, but to say how they understood that times were really hard and it was terribly difficult for them and they were trying to balance all this stuff. But could they please remember that the archive and archaeology service was really, really good yeah, <laughs> really, really good. And, um, and they were sure they, that, um, in other words, we're watching you. Um, but the most important thing is to create advocates in your own organisation. All through the process um, of this change within the County Council, we've needed advocates in HR, procurement, finance, commercial teams, admin, IT, and other service managers. Without them, it would have been 10 times more difficult. Most people will help if they can. And these colleagues are actually your greatest allies in making your case. And they are in all the meetings you are not. So, yeah. Okay, last thing. Be resilient. Easy to say, hard to do. If you have to be bloody minded, if you have to rewrite the same business case five times in five different ways, just do it. But to do that, you need to build resilience in yourself and others. If we're not careful, much of our energy is spent by all of us, and I've done this loads of times, on things we can't change, leaving as little emotional energy to deliver the change we can. Now, there are many ways to kind of deal with this, but I found this one is quite useful. Very quickly, look at all your problems, identify the things you can change, change them. Look at the things you can influence, start to influence them. Things that you have no influence over, forget. Um, obviously, depending on where you are in the, in the food chain, that will be different. It's, it's a really simple tool, but it works quite, it works quite well. Finally, do not fear. Things are hard, but they've been harder. Um, as I did mention, I've been around a bit. <laughs> in the archaeological world, yeah. <laughs> And I, although nobody wants this, I, I have observed that lack of money and changes in regulations do drive change, which not all of it is positive, but a lot of it is positive. This is not the end of British archaeology. It is, however, a period of great pressure and change. But if we hold on to our ideals and work together, something different and more suited to the 21st century will come out of this and we will have created our own little bit of history.